So what did happen to those other nine lepers? Why didn't they also return and give thanks? The story doesn't tell us. We have no idea what was going on in their heads. What we do know is that they were doing exactly what Jesus had told them to do. They were going to show themselves to the priests. And in spite of the fact that they followed Jesus' directions to the letter, we learn today that these nine missed out on something. When that tenth leper came back to give thanks, Jesus told him, Your faith has made you well. And that last word in Greek, the one that gets translated, has made you well, it's actually a pretty special word. In the church, it's a loaded word. It's a word that has a range of meanings, from being made well, to healed, or rescued. But the most direct translation is to be saved. Jesus told the leper, your faith has saved you. And so I'm sitting here wondering, what do Christians mean when we talk about being saved? Is just having a spot reserved in heaven for us when we die? Its use here at the end of this story, spoken to a single grateful leper when nine others were also healed of their malady, does make me question. What does Jesus mean when he says saved? Clearly, it means something more than just being cured. Ten lepers were cleansed of their disease, but only one was saved. If the word means what we might think it does, then Jesus might come across as kind of punitive here. While he freely offers healing, he seems to be withholding the true gift, this salvation or eternal life or whatever, only for those who passed the test they didn't know they were being given. That's how some Christians seem to see God, as a divine scorekeeper, constantly adjusting our point totals based on how well we follow the rules, waiting to give us a passing or failing grade at the end of time. This story might fit with that God except for one thing. As I said, the nine lepers do exactly what Jesus tells them to. They follow his commandments to the letter, but they still miss out on being saved. It's no wonder some folks have a hard time believing in a God like this, that that God would be worthy of praise, let alone thanks. What I notice when I read this story is that it comes immediately on the heels of another one, in which Jesus uses the example of a servant. Who among you, he asks his disciples, would say to a slave that has just come in from the field, come at once and take your place at the table? Do you thank a slave for doing what is commanded? So also, when you would do what you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We've done only what we ought to have done. In that context, I read today's story, and I wonder if the other nine lepers in this story are maybe treating Jesus like a slave that's only done what he ought to have done. They asked him to cleanse him, and he did. End of story. So Jesus asks, do you thank a slave for doing what was commanded? And their answer is no. The trouble with a scorekeeper God is that a God like that only does what a God like that ought to do. The job of that God is to reward the righteous and punish the wicked. If that God gives you a place in heaven for being a good person and following all the rules, do you give thanks? Of course not. That God is a worthless slave, just doing what that God ought to have done, right? The true master in that story is each individual person who has the power to make their own choices and to demand of God what they are owed. The tenth leper in this story, on the other hand, when he sees that he's been cleansed, recognizes that for what it is, pure grace. He knows that he has no right to ask, nor any reason to expect Jesus to do anything. St. Luke makes sure to point out that this, this man, the one who came back, that he is a Samaritan. Maybe that's the reason he's able to recognize the grace of this situation. Unlike all of the other presumably Jewish lepers, who might assume that a Jewish rabbi would naturally help them, 
The Samaritan has no such assumptions. And so I wonder if, in the case of this Samaritan leper, being saved means recognizing his own need for God's help, which, gives him, which helps him comprehend God's desire to give it. Jesus didn't heal the man because he was asked. He healed him because he wanted to. By recognizing that God is not a scorekeeper to be persuaded or bought, he actually learns something about God. He learns how much this God loves him and to what lengths this God will go to help him. He learns that God loves him enough to cure his leprosy. And that is cause for giving thanks. If this is the case, then perhaps one thing we can take from this story is that it's not obedience or strength of character or pure intentions that make God love us. In fact, God doesn't love us because of anything about who we are. God loves us because of who God is. God loves because God is love. To love creatures such as us is in God's very nature. God gives eternal life not as a reward, but because giving life is what God delights in doing, because that's what God wants to do. This is what St. Paul means when he says that when we are faithless, God is faithful, because God cannot deny God's self. So maybe eternal life then isn't salvation. Maybe eternal life is just what God promises. It's not a reward, not a bribe for good behavior. If eternal life is all we're in this for, then we're free to hurry on our way, just like those other nine lepers off to see the priests. I think that there is something much more interesting and much more important that this story is opening our eyes to see, and that that's the power of God's love. Naaman experienced that power at the Jordan. Paul experienced it on the road to Damascus. It's a love that has the ability to heal and cleanse, to forgive sins, to change a person from the inside out. But most importantly, it's a love that God freely chooses to give to us who so seldom deserve it. In that first story, I noticed that Naaman's entitlement nearly caused him to miss out on experiencing that love. It was only when he let go of his own self-importance that he was able to experience grace. And when he did, that grace was so powerful and so wonderful that it totally changed him. It was that wonderful and powerful grace that made Paul happy to endure beatings and imprisonment and worse, if only he was allowed to share that good news with others, to help them experience it as well. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, he writes, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul's own story reminds us that this glory is not the glory of a con conquering warrior or a mighty ruler, it's the glory of a man dying on a cross for the love of the very people who put him there. In that image, we see the true power of this love, the power to give up all things because we've been given so much more than we could ever lose. The power to redeem evil itself into a force for good. To be saved is, be, is to be given the power to love as God loves, to love with one's whole being, even to the last breath. And we can only love like this because we have seen the power of God's love to bring life from death. I don't know about you, but that's not a love I'm capable of on my own. I need help. I think we all do. We all first need to be cleansed of our fears and our hatreds and our prejudices. 
and then nursed on that love as we mature in it. And that is exactly the help, the salvation, the healing, the rescue that Jesus gives us in this community. Here our sins are washed away in the waters of baptism. Here we are suckled at this table with the very milk of grace. Here we are washed in love and fed in love and taught by love. And here we proclaim this love and sing this love and pray this love until the day when this love will finally transform the earth, giving eternal life to all creation. Even and perhaps especially to those who don't deserve it. I like to think that that's what this leper saw. Not his own clean skin, but the care and the concern that Jesus had for him, a foreigner. In this healing, perhaps he even glimpsed the promise of the healing for the whole world. Regardless, what he saw was not a man doing what he was asked, but a person who cared. A person who showed him a God who cares. And that's the salvation that each and every one of us has the power to show the world.